I think that the, the worst thing that an effects house can do or a director can do in creating a monster is just referencing other movies. When I look at a piece of art, I look at it and I, and I ask the artist, what are your influences? And if they start naming the wrong guys, uh, they don't even need to, I mean, I already saw it in the pieces. You see it and it's, a, what, it's almost like an airbrushed piece of art on the side of a van. You know, it's like, it, you know where it came from. You know that it came from the most pejorative stuff. But DDT's frame of reference is a lot of fine art. Uh, or if I reference a particular subject, or if I say Rackham, Arthur Rackham, or if I say a particular painter, they, they, they can go and research that. They come very well prepared to discuss the designs. You know, they, they don't feel comic book, and they, they won't feel like uh, they came from another movie. Cuando Guillermo nos habló del fauno, que no era un fauno corriente, ¿no? El fauno corriente sería un fauno medio cabra, medio hombre, con unos cuernitos, pero el fauno que quería Guillermo era un fauno medio árbol, ¿no? Como si estuviera mimetizando con el bosque, ¿no? Que estuviera metido en un árbol o algo así. Y entonces es un concepto un poco extraño. We wanted the fawn to look like he was made out of the woods. He was made out of materials you would find there. He was made out of moss, bark, uh, a tree trunk. And it was very elegant and at the same time uh, sort of uh, made of coarse textures. It was about taking the characters that are prototypical in a fairy tale, like the giant frog, the fairies, and the ogre, which is the pale man, and giving it a, a spin, making them look uh, not like every other ogre or like every other fairy. Guillermo is the director with whom you have to fight at the time of working, right? Because with the great majority of directors, you teach a design and... Ah, good, bravo! Guillermo, no, 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 no. Guillermo is like... No, 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 coge al cabrón de Sandoval y que me haga algo más. Y venga, y dale, y dale, y transformar, y transformar, y transformar. Y al final, casi siempre, Guillermo tiene esa, esa manera de, coge, de, de, de mezclar cosas, ¿no? De coger el puchero y decir, esto de aquí, esto de allá, esto de aquí, esto de allá, y este es el personaje. Ivana. Crouch a little more. No, mi madre está enferma. Para nada. No es excusa para la negligencia. Él es Doug Jones. Hola. Que hace del fauno y del hombre pálido. I've been acting for 19 years now, almost 20 years now, and over half of my jobs have been under some kind of rubber suit, latex, silicone. Glue, zippers, snaps, buckles, <laughs> something. <laughs> I have to think not only like an actor, but I have to think like an athlete. I have to physically push myself through a certain amount of discomfort, a certain amount of, of fatigue, and sometimes a certain amount of pain, depending on what the suit is and what's poking at you or what's, you know, what position you have to hold for a long time. Like in this, I have to squat a lot. I have to crouch down a lot, so my thighs start to tremble. And I have to forget that I have weak legs and just push through it and find the character and make the scene happen. Doug Jones se mueve muy bien, pero uh, es decir, ya el hecho de que cuando pones un maquillaje, aparte tan complicado como es, porque es todo el cuerpo, lleva los zancos y tal, mm. hay tantas cosas que son un problema a la hora de actuar que yo creo que cualquier otro actor se hubiera quedado como paralizado. Hoy lo estábamos comentando, hay una secuencia en el ático y él se va hacia atrás dando su texto en su español especial, uh, llegando hasta un punto del decorado en que se queda a oscuras y él se baja, uh, se, se, se esconde en, entre los, los muebles y todo lo que hay por ahí. Y es que dices, pero ¿cómo, cómo puede hacerlo? Es decir, no ve bien no camina bien. 
uh, y está dando el no diálogo en español. español que y que le después, preocupaba claro, mucho. Es muy difícil dar claro. el diálogo en español cuando no sabes español y tal, y está muy pendiente de lo que estaba diciendo porque le da mucha rabia no, ha, no hacerlo bien, ¿no? Y claro, ves eso y dices, pero es increíble, es, 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 es uh, sobrenatural que pueda hacer un, un, una acción como esta llevando todo el maquillaje que lleva. So we're having a day as pan. El fauno. Hoy. Vale. Okay. Esto es el, el body, lo que le ponemos primero. Es la primera pieza que le ponemos. La parte del, del pecho, la torería que le llamamos, le tapa todo esto. Esto es para las pilas que lleva los servos de la cabeza. Lo metemos dentro con mucho talco, con mucho polvo de talco, porque si no le cuesta mucho entrar. Y bueno, después de esta pieza lo que le ponemos es la torerilla, que es esto. Es una pieza pues con cremallera por detrás. Y bueno, la abrimos, se la ponemos, cerramos la cremallera y una vez cerrada la cremallera juntamos con adhesivo estas, estas raicillas ¿no? para, que, para que no se note la, crema, la cremallera. Después de esto lo que tenemos son las piernas, que es lo más complicado para que entre, porque básicamente aparte de que el, el traje le va muy muy ajustado para que después se le, se le adapte muy bien a él, pues tiene la complicación de que uh, tiene la extensión de las piernas esta, que nos hace un poco complicado para entrar dentro, pero bueno, más o menos para meterle dentro del traje tardamos de todas las piezas como media hora, entre media hora y 25 minutos, y la última pieza que le ponemos son las manos, son unos dedos más largos y, bueno, a partir de un punto tienen una extensión más dura. Es como si llevara un, un dedal con, con una extensión de plástico rígido dentro para que tenga los dedos un poco más largos. Porque siempre que le estás poniendo algo en los dedos, pues claro, con que los engorda un poco, pues necesitas hacerlos un poco más largos, ¿no? Bueno, y esto básicamente son las piezas que lleva, aparte de la cabeza. Por todo el mundo, vuestro verdadero padre hizo abrir portales que permitieran vuestro regreso. A ver, la cuestión de esto es los, los mecanismos que lleva debajo de la, de, la, de la piel de espuma. Esto es la piel de espuma, que ya se ha usado. Ahora está un poco fea, pobrecilla. Y, uh, bueno, básicamente, lo complicado de este personaje es que está... La boca es del actor, ¿no? La, la boca del actor está aquí. Y esto se lo pegamos, bueno, hasta ahora esta pieza va por separado. Pero esto se lo pegamos aquí de manera que el actor pueda actuar y pueda hablar bien. Pero a partir de los labios hacia arriba ya lo hemos completamente eliminado. La nariz, su nariz está chafada con un plástico de manera que pueda dar este, este aspecto más plano. ¿no? Y después los ojos, estos ojos de cabra están encima de los suyos. Entonces lo que, lo que hemos hecho para esto son unos mecanismos de parpadeo, de un parpadeo sutil y claro, con que no se podía meter nada aquí, todos los motores han tenido que ir aquí arriba. ¡Rápido, Alteza! ¡Entregádmelo ya! La luna llena brilla en el cielo y podemos abrir el portal. As creature suits and makeups go, this character of Fauno es the most comfortable and least irritating thing I've ever had on. So oftentimes a suit like this is all one piece that just slides on and all the weight is on your shoulders. But this one is better because the legs are a separate piece that, that hook to a belt in here. So all the weight of the legs is on my hips, not my shoulders. And the hips hold that belt securely in place so the legs don't droop. My belly, this is a separate piece that's held up over the shoulders and it's just independent. And this is an, another independent piece that I can rotate in and it, it's completely separate from the others. So the movement of this suit is so comfortable and so uh, easy to wear. It's a very, very good design. Thank you. Indeed. Thank you. Indeed. Thank you, Doug. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> if there's one thing that I'm known for, it's 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 being a physical actor. And this kind of a role that, that requires movement and wearing a lot of costuming or in makeup. 
they, these are the types of jobs that usually come looking for me. And the jobs where I get to play myself are the ones that I have to go and tap dance for and, and audition for. And, uh, so, so I guess this is the this is the niche that I've created for myself in in movies. We'll be here. here. So she's going to come that close to me. Yeah. Oh, okay. We have to get off Is the dagger in this hand? This hand. Okay. Dejaos guiar por ellas. Iréis a un lugar muy peligroso. Tened cuidado. Lo que ahí dormita no es humano. Este es el personaje del hombre pálido, que es, ha nacido a, de dos ideas diferentes, de dos conceptos diferentes, que uno era el concepto de hacer un maquillaje en el cuerpo, que es, es lo que vemos desde cabeza hasta, hasta aquí, hasta debajo de la cintura, y después lo otro es este otro concepto, que, es, uh, que son uh, las piernas como de marioneta encima de las piernas del actor con, un, con una líquida croma. Realmente la referencia que nos dio Guillermo era un hombre que había sido súper, súper gordo y como si de repente se hubiera adelgazado. Entonces le caen todos los colgajos. I asked them to sculpt him like they were sculpting an old man that lost a lot of weight. And when the sculpture arrived, I did a sketch of it and I removed the face. Y entonces de repente Guillermo llama y dice, mira, ¿sabes qué? La parte de abajo la dejas así, tal como está, pero la parte de arriba la vamos a hacer lisa completamente, sin ojos y con los agujeros de la nariz aquí arriba. Digo, digo, ¿cómo se lo digo yo a este hombre que ha estado aquí esculpiendo durante tanto tiempo? Pero... Pero creo que pero, fue para bien, claro, porque es más... Es, da más grima que Sí, son esas cosas que chocan de, de, de las ideas de Guillermo, ¿no? Mm. Que dices, estás haciendo una cosa y de repente te dice, esto hay que cambiarlo así, y dices, no. <risa> pero bueno, tú lo haces y al final, sí, resulta que funciona. Inicialmente lo que se hace es que sobre el molde del actor vas modelando todo el cuerpo entero, el cuerpo, la espalda, las piernas, las manos y se modelaron aparte. Y una vez que lo has modelado, pues lo que hacen es que se dividen esos moldes en partes para que sea fácil, aparte de sacar las copias, la aplicación. Entonces el maquillaje pues tiene los brazos que son de silicona que son piezas separadas, tiene la parte de la espalda que es separada, tiene la parte del pecho, bueno el pecho y la tripa que es todo separada, y las piernas. Aunque sea por ejemplo los brazos silicona, pues incluso los brazos tienen distintas, eh, distintas densidades para que tenga distinto peso y distinto movimiento. Y eso lo que hicimos fue llenar pues brazos de silicona, manos de silicona, piernas de espuma, y una vez que hemos sacado todas las piezas, pues lo que hacíamos es que hay que pintarlas. Y lo único era intentar unificar el look, que como la, como la silicona tiende a ser bastante más traslúcida, pues tuvimos que hacerlo lo menos traslúcida posible. Y que la espuma de látex pareciera lo más traslúcida posible. You are so pampered. Pampered? Yeah, they take good care of me. All to make you look your best.
this is a horrifying sequence. This whole area right here is covered with an appliance, and you can see his mouth, the inside of his, and his cheek right there is painted blue. And he actually stitches shut the prosthetic right there on his face. Very brave actor. We're going through and actually taking out his cheek that's visible underneath there. Esto es por toda esa mierda que tú le permites leer. Mira lo que has conseguido. Por favor, déjanos solas. Yo hablaré con ella, cariño. Muy bien. Como quieras. La mandrágora, eh, en realidad, es, es como tiene forma de un pequeño hombre raíz. Entonces, soñó ella la mandrágora con poder nacer de nuevo. Y poco a poco se va haciendo hombre. Pero en esta película... Para lo que sirve es la, man la mandrágora es para que mi madre se cure. Entonces yo le pongo un poquitín de sangre cada día con leche podrida y va creciendo poco a poco. Y entonces intenta curar a Ariadna Hill que hace de Carmen, la madre de Ofelia. The early origins of the myth of the mandrake said that the mandrake was born out of the semen of the hanged men under the gallows. When they were hanged, they ejaculated and that that semen seeped into the ground and a mandrake was born. Yo al principio pensaba que la mandrágora era una cosa pues ficticia, en cierta manera, ¿no? Que la mandrágora sería una raíz, pero y si vimos fotos de raíces y tal que sí que parecen un poco mm, personitas, ¿no? Un de ahí a, de al, al diseño que nosotros hemos hecho es diferente, ¿no? Porque eh, Guillermo dice, "No, más forma de personita y tal que quede más más fantástico y ahí está la mandrágorilla." Esta es la Esta es la primera mandrágora, la que el fauno le da a Ofelia. Es una mandrágora posable, es la que hemos visto que, que ponía en la leche. Entonces, después de esta, una vez le da la leche y la, y la sangre, pasamos a esta, que es la, la misma, pero gordita. Y esta misma gordita, pues es la versión, esta está pintada y la mecánica, la mecánica aún no, pero es la versión mecánica va a ser como esta. Entonces, lo que va... Lo que vamos a rodar seguramente es Vidal arrancándola del bol ¿no? y dejando ahí las raíces, se verán algunas raíces por aquí, y echarla al fuego. Entonces cuando la eche al fuego cambiaremos y pondremos la, la que se mueve. Aunque seguramente eh, el equipo de Etira Storza y Everett van a hacer eh, mandraguarra digital. Originally it was, uh... We had shot the scene. It's uh, Ophelia putting a bowl of milk down and she puts the mandrake in the bowl of milk. That was the original first shot. Now we had shot it with a little potato with tracking marks that she had in her hand that was roughly the size of the mandrake. And then she put that in the bowl. But then we did a reference take for lighting. She actually had the prop, but the prop would not unfold. It was just kind of in a, a fetal position. And she put that in there. And then when Guillermo got in the editing room, he liked that take the best, which causes problems for us. That's why we shot the potato version, because the potato was slightly smaller, so I could put the mandrake over top of that. So we, that was our first battle, I guess, in terms of trying to figure out what to do. Um, so we had actually had to paint that mandrake out and put our CG mandrake in, and then lay it over top of the mandrake once it got in the mill. So it was an incredibly difficult shot, but it was the performance thing for Guillermo. Ophelia's eyeline was so much better, and her performance was much better when she had the actual puppet in her hand instead of a potato.
one of the instances in the movie where we were faced with a horrible thing was the frog sequence, the toad sequence in, under the roots of the tree. Originally we had constructed a huge set for this toad and it was meant to be more of a fight between the girl and the toad. And she had to trick him into eating the stones at the end of that fight. We had, I don't know, 10 more shots digitally and so forth. And uh, DDT was supposed to have constructed that toad to jump around and move. And when it came time to the frog, we were having these discussions. Is it going to be too heavy? And uh, they went with their instinct and they decided once it could handle it and it was not too heavy. And of course, the goddamn frog shows up and it's too heavy. Now, the set had already been constructed. It was a huge set with a, uh, like a womb made of roots and a dripping candelabra of amber in the center. It was absolutely gorgeous. And uh, we couldn't use it. If the frog didn't move in that set, it was going to look like a tiny frog in an immense set and a tiny girl. It was going to be completely the wrong effect. So very quickly, I was faced with two choices. Shoot it in the set and showcase the set, which would ruin the scene, or reinvent the scene very fast for another set, which was the root chamber, the root caverns in the tree, which we built only for her to go by. But then I thought, well, if the cavern is very small and tight and we can put the frog there, it's going to look like a bigger frog because it's in a contained space. And uh, the confrontation will be more about the girl tricking him into eating the stones, thinking it's a, a, a pill bug, a rolly poly. And uh, it transformed in, I think, a day or two. We had to think that fast. The scene was one thing on Friday. It was another thing on Monday. So it went also from being a mostly practical frog to it being mostly CG. Guillermo rethought the scene and thought that it would be better suited if it took place in the roots in that tunnel and kept it more claustrophobic. And when we got into that set, we realized that it was just too claustrophobic for the performer to move much. So as we got Muncie in the suit, we sort of realized, well, some of the stuff worked and some of the stuff didn't. So what we did is we shot clean plates. Every time there was a toad, we removed the toad and I would shoot clean. Where the puppet couldn't do certain things, we would have to sort of take it to the next level. <laughs> We got a mock head of the stick bug, uh, and we got, uh, actually Guillermo owns a real stick bug that's in glass, that's like a taxidermy uh, piece that he gave us for reference, and we used that to start off with, but it, but he wanted it to be real, so we actually found a, a, a bug guy in Santa Maria who was an entomologist who owned all these stick bugs, real live ones, and we used those as reference. We uh, actually owned, actually became parents of two stick bugs that we called Cheech and Chong, and they actually get credit in the film. They passed away, unfortunately, during filming, but they had a thousand babies. So we had a lot of stick bugs for reference. And that was great. We shot hours and hours of a video reference of the bugs crawling around on glass and on sticks to kind of get their movement. But Guillermo wanted a different type of movement. He didn't want uh, just verbatim insect. He also wanted a little more intelligence to it. So we sort of took that uh, kind of a ground based on a a real stick bug, and then we would kind of run with a style that Guillermo liked. I, uh, I thought they were uh, perfect creatures, sort of angels, you know, because they're so perfectly constructed. And it just came instinctively, the idea of if this girl really has this reality, the magical reality be so strong, then she would bend the objective reality to that of her fairy tale. I think that it's, it's a very delicate moment in which the insect looks at the illustration and says, oh, okay, so that's what you think a fairy looks like. Well, let me show you. And, 
and it transforms into its own self, which is could be seen as an imitation of the illustration in the book or her actually showing her what a fairy really looks like, you know, but it's nevertheless a magical moment. And my, one of my favorite, if not my favorite moment of magic in the film. DDT gave, say, a, a rough concept, and it was from Hellboy. Uh, there were these fairies at the BPRD. It was like the Spear of Longinus. And then in the background, there's these fairies in the jar that DDT had made for the first Hellboy. And Guillermo always remembered those and loved them. So they sent us a copy or a reference image of that. That's sort of what we took from uh, the concept. But they had hair. and. I always ask him, well, why did these not have hair? He goes, well, he wanted them to be um, more insect-like and not have long flowing hair. Hence, you know, they came from the stick bug. So the hair was never a question, even though I thought it was a little odd at first. And we used a really interesting idea. We took uh, crushed leaves, photos of leaves that we had scanned, and we used that as the texture. So we kept it very earthly, very uh, tactile, very much part of the nature world that pan comes from. Wood, uh, leaves, uh, grass, roots, things like that. And Guillermo loved that concept. I come from a makeup effects background as well, and I worked on a lot of the George Romero zombie films. And uh, Guillermo remembered Day of the Dead had these very, you know, particular nasty bites in the film. And we kind of referenced that. The initial concept, I think, came from the Goya painting. Uh, I think it's Saturn eating his son, you know, it's like this, the big stretchy meat. That's sort of the, where the original concept I think came from. But then we talked about the bites that I did in, in Day of the Dead. And he thought, oh, yes, let's do that. Let's make out a zombie picture, just for that moment. Directing a piece of animation starts in the set. I grabbed the little puppet that we use for referencing the fairy. And I, I show more or less the area in which it's going to be moving. And then we do the, the video turnovers, which is uh, me in front of a screen talking to the guys in Cafe FX, and I tell them where to where the creature is going to move, how it's going to move, why, and so forth. And I think it's a very effective communication tool. You know, I'm here. They are pointing at it, all three of them. This is it. This is it. Come and open it, you know? And this one flies, hovers, and goes around her, you know, and comes back. The third tool for uh, directing animation is actually uh, a conference call with Cafe FX with a, um, a virtual screen on the computer where we are in real time sharing that screen with a mouse. So I can draw on the frame of the film straight and at the same time, real time, they're watching the drawing, arrows or signaling areas, as if I was sharing a table with them. Those three tools allow uh, anyone to direct animation from a remote location. Well, to me, a movie is a collaboration, and uh, there are certain elements in a collaboration that you can do without or do with them being flawed, and you keep limping until the final uh, stage, you know, but others are crucial, and DDT and Cafe FX together, the way they were able to combine the, their techniques, for example, in the frog sequence, in the giant toad sequence, uh, or the way they enhance the work of each other. I could not imagine this movie without DDT or Cafe Effects.